haben ja nur noch so, keine Ahnung, 40, 50 Jahre, bis es irgendwann mal alles den Bach runtergeht. Kohle weg. So schlimm wie das ist mit den Arbeitsplätzen. Damit dann meine Kinder noch wissen, was Schnee ist. Wir müssen alle mitmachen, sonst macht es ja gar keinen Sinn, oder? Und von daher ist mein Appell eher an die Politik, ja, die Wirtschaft ist bereit, hoffe ich, glaube ich, zumindest ein Teil. Die Bevölkerung ist auch soweit und jetzt brauchen wir die politischen Rahmenbedingungen, damit das in die richtige Richtung gehen kann und zwar schneller als bisher. Klimaschutz, Umweltschutz und die Stabilisierung des Planeten, der Ökosysteme, der Grundlagen also menschlicher Existenz, sollten uns auch etwas wert sein. Das ist auch eine Haltungsfrage. Die Klimakrise braucht gesamtgesellschaftlichen Diskurs. Schön, dass Sie in diesem Jahr Teil der Tagesspiegel Debate Energy sind. Ja, nun wirklich herzlich willkommen. Well, a warm welcome to Tagesspiegel Debate Energy together with Uniper SE. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But first of all, I would like to say a few words, tell you why we're doing this. My name is Stefan Andreas Kastorf. I'm the publisher of Tagesspiegel. What we want to do is to create a basis for a discussion concerning a question that is vital for the future. Climate protection and the transformation of the energy sector remains extremely important. It's one of the central topics of these days. We just heard that when a female candidate was nominated by the Greens, and she also referred to that. And that's why we would like to talk to various stakeholders from economics, politics, the civil society and industry. We'd like to talk about how ecology and economy can be reconciled and what role hydrogen could play in this context. We have Svenja Schulze, the Federal Minister for the Environment, Andreas Pinkwart, the State Premier of Northern Westphalia, Dr. Jochen Eichholt from Siemens Energy, David Bryson from Jumanuper, Professor Dr. Verena Grimm from the member, a member of the German Council of Economic Experts and a mem board member of Zentrum Wasserstoff Bayer, and uh, Francesco Lacamero from IRENA, Stefan Andreas, um, Klaus Dieter Maubach from Uniper, and also the Cem Özdemir, a member of the German Bundestag, Michael Vassiliadas, the chairman of IGBC, E, trade union, very influential. All of them are top-notch participants in this conference. The program consists of fireside chats, keynotes, input, and the presentation of this year's energy report. The Opinion Research Institute, CIVE, is going to tell us more about that. Many, many people were interviewed on the topic of the energy transition, a topic that affects and moves all of us. Also, we will have two panel discussions, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions to participate in the individual items on the agenda. Enter your questions next to the stream on the platform of this event, and then I'll try to answer your questions and incorporate them into the discussion to answer them. Jakob Schland, who you will meet in a few minutes, our esteemed um, chief editor, head of research, energy and climate of the Tagesspiegel. Our publishing house, together with Uniper, is offering a platform for discussions on the current developments on the political framework conditions and on the societal influences and implications in general. The energy transition affects all of us. And that's why I would like to introduce you to our supporter, the person who made this possible, who is Klaus Dieter Malbach. Since April of 2021, he's the CEO of Uniper. Professor Maubach, Uniper is an international energy company with 12,000 employees in more than 40 countries. Previously, Klaus Dieter Maubach was the head of the supervisory board of Uniper and a member of the administrative council of the 75% stakeholder Fortum. 
He was also a member of the executive board of Aon previously and a member of the Energy Agency Board. Professor Mawa, a warm welcome to you. We are looking forward to what you have to say by way of a welcoming address. You have the floor. Dear ministers, dear members of the Bundestag and the state parliaments, dear Mr. Kastorf, and ladies and gentlemen, in the past year, Uniper, the Uniper, Uniper initiated Debate Energy. The purpose was and remains to create a platform for a general um, discourse of the society. Tagesspiegel Fadak is a partner that is making this exchange possible, and that's why we would like to thank Mr. Kastoff as the publisher of Der Tagesspiegel and thank you to all the employees who were involved. The change and disruptive transformation have become part of the energy industry over the past few years. Very often they're associated with a changing acceptance on the side of politics and the civil society with regard to various energy sources and types of generation. That's why the discourse with the energy industry has not always been that easy. But currently we've reached a situation where we have a consensus, that's a historic opportunity, a consensus amongst the civil society, politics, and the German industry concerning the fact that the environment has priority over um, low prices and the industry. We have more or less agreement with regard to climate protection targets. The discourse, our discourse, will therefore not really be led with regard to the targets, but with regard to how we are going to achieve the energy transition. That's one of the reasons why we're going to hold this event. How are we going to make sure that we have a quick, efficient, an efficient change towards a more sustainable energy industry? How can we reconcile ecology and economy? One of the central questions in this regard is how are we going to design the regulatory framework? Whenever you talk about the right political framework or legal framework, you have to ask yourself whether you want to have an incentivizing regulation or whether we want to have a regulation that defines rules. Well, the past shows that we have the choice, but the past also shows that incentivizing regulations are successful. Let me give you an example. The emission European emissions trading system is one of the major achievements of the past few years, and it is a regulation that creates a binding framework and is incentivizing at the same time. Internalization of costs of carbon emissions has been and remains successful. Efficiency improvements with existing plants and investments in new plants are a good proof. Now we have to choose the same direction when we talk about the energy sources of the future, hydrogen. We need the right incentives. And if you have the right incentives, the debate on the colors of hydrogen becomes superfluous, whether it's blue or turquoise or green, or the discussion of gas as a bridge technology. This is one of the questions that we should discuss today. And it is a fact that in the long run, a company cannot operate successfully against the general mood in society. The energy industry has experienced this in a painful way over the past decades, but the energy industry has understood, we have understood. A very important impetus in this debate is the energy report, which Uniper commissioned. It was um, developed by CIVE, by the CIVE Institute, and will, will be presented by the founder of CIVE, Janina Mutze. The energy transition is cl closely associated with social compatibility, but we have to move forward. We have to be open with regard to embarking on the path towards climate, climate carbon neutrality. As the third largest producer of green energy, we are making a huge contribution. European electricity production is to become carbon neutral by 2035. At the same time, in the area of renewable energies, we will build up up to 3 gigawatts and established energy production locations will develop into forward-looking energy hubs. 
energy transition hub. So we're going to make a huge contribution towards decarbonizing the economy and the society in, in Europe. At the same time, we want to secure growth and employment in the European countries in which we are operating. We have a huge opportunity to start global hydrogen industry quickly. We're going to pave the way for that. The preconditions are good because hydrogen is supported by the population and because politics have already made available significant investment in research and technology and in building up a corresponding infrastructure. And thirdly, because the energy industry is has received support from the trade unions and has already initiated very many projects in this regard. The debate energy conference today is definitely an impetus with regard to the debate in society. This will be achieved by the top-notch panelists and also by the other speakers who will provide us with inspiration. So debate energy five months before the elections to the German parliament Debate Energy is the first milestone in the energy policy discourse of this year. I would like to thank all participants for their openness and clarity in this debate. Your questions and opinions are very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Maura. Openness and clarity, everybody is supposed to participate. We're going to start with the discussion, and I'll start with you, Mr. Maura. Um, now, the first question that I would like to raise concerns the momentum. Why have we only started now? We've been discussing the topic of the energy transition for more than 20 years. I can remember when the Chancellor Gerhard Schröder and the Minister for the Environment, Jürgen Trittin, already talked about the energy transition. That was 20 years ago. But what about the momentum? How are we going to catch up? Well, I think it's an overall societal process that has been initiated. Normally, in uh, situations of a crisis, like, for instance, the financial crisis 10 to 12 years ago, climate protection was no longer that important. And potentially, climate protection could have been neglected during the corona crisis, but that was not the case. Climate protection, climate change, environmental protection, has remained at the top of the agenda. And I think for many things you need time and, of course, the right momentum. I can't really explain why we have, why it is the right time now, but I think we've developed a, or a, a process that is irreversible and that is forward-looking. Now, you, this is not Fridays for Future, this is really Tuesdays for Future, and you're at the top of this movement, aren't you? Now, there's one thing that worried me to a certain extent, and that's incentivizing active regulation. When I hear that, um, I'm a bit concerned. Regulation is a big thing in Germany. We're almost over-regulated. What is your request in this regard? How would you like to see the regulatory framework? Well, I can give you an example of what this, it should not be. A regulation that defines rules that says, for instance, um, that certain power plants should not be operated because they exceed a certain level of carbon emissions, that's a regulation that defines rules. However, an incentivizing regulation is what we have in the emissions trading system where see, carbon costs or carbon emission costs were internalized. We found technologies which made the interna internalization of these costs necessary, uh, possible. And that's what I would like to say for hydrogen as well. If we are able to expand or, or extend emissions, the emissions trading system to other areas, we would have sufficient incentives for hydrogen as well. Being open towards a wide range of different technologies, that's important. Why is hydrogen on the agenda now? It has existed for a long time. Well, I think because we've all understood that an energy system that is to a large extent based on renewable energies, will be based on renewable energies in the future, requires a chemical en energy that can be used as a long-term storage system. This cannot be oil or coal, and in the long term it cannot be natural gas. So we need a different chemical energy. We need 
need this industry, this, this energy now and the right infrastructure. Hydrogen is the right answer. Well, I could continue to talk to you for hours, but my colleagues are urging me to continue, and I would like to ask Jakob Schlant to come to the floor. He is the chief editor um, of the department, Research, Energy and Climate, and he's going to have a fireside chat with Francesco La Camara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kastov. Thank you, Mr. Maubach. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Jakob Schlein. I'm head of uh, the um, background area climate and energy for Tages in der Energie um, Spiegel. Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, for a 15-minute fireside chat. Please note that throughout the event, you can get involved by asking questions in the window to the right of the live screen. Mr. La Camera, great that you were able to join us from Abu Dhabi. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jakob. It's really a pleasure to have, uh, to have uh, the chance to, to, to discuss with you and talk with you about the energy transition. Thank you very much for that. Wonderful. You are the leading um, person, um, uh, the Director General of the authoritative agency for renewable energy globally, uh, IRENA. Uh, could you give us an update on the global status quo of renewable energies, about pricing developments, um, about the spread of uh, the use of renewable energies, about global trends, about investment necessities? Uh, sure, sure. And uh, trying to be brief, to allow for questions to come, uh, I will use uh, a few slides, and my colleague Nicole Buxtaller will help me to manage the slides. So, if we can put on the presentation, and starting from uh, the first slide that is dealing with uh, the uh, uh, increasing uh, addition of uh, renewable capacity into the market. As we can see from the slides, in the last years, the installed capacity of renewables has been outpacing systematically the fossil fuel one. And uh, in the last year, uh, with the pandemic, we have uh, a record of 260 gigawatt of renewables being installed. This means 82% of the total installed capacity. Now, one third of all uh, installed capacity is coming from renewables, and we got this result a few years before than uh, was expected, or at least forecast by many entities around, uh, around the world. And in Europe, we have been assisting to increase of 34 gigawatts, that uh, is a 60% increase of the global, the European capacity of renewables. We go to the second slide that we presented in our uh, World Energy Outlook preview, where we uh, indicate the, 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 the component for uh, decrease the CO2 emissions uh, from now to up to 2050 to be in line with 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. And we see the energy efficiency is playing a very important role together with renewables and the comprehensive electricity, uh, the holistic electrification of the energy system. We see that also green hydrogen will play an important role together with a minor role of CCS and the modern bioenergy with a CCS apply for bioenergy input. So all these elements will uh, allow us to get the uh, decrease in the emission we need to be in line with the Paris uh, Agreement. We can go then to the next slide where we talk about the hydrogen production cost. We know that this is a special focus of this event to talk about hydrogen, and we can see how the uh, cost of hydrogen has been decreasing sharply in, uh, in, in the last years and is going to continue uh, decreasing in the years to come. And, uh, you know, we, it was expected green hydrogen to be competitive by 2050, it was last summer, the forecast from many entities, but we as ARENA, we discovered that uh, green hydrogen could be already 
competitive in 2030. And many, com many companies think that could be happening uh, already in 2025. This brings uh, uh, to our last slides concerning investment, as you request. So how much investment do we need to be consistent with the 1.5 uh, uh, degree goal under the Paris Agreement? We have uh, confronting the actual scenario. So we are, we are going with the actual commitments and the actual commitment uh, uh, foreseen uh, a cumulative impact or cumulative investment of 98 trillion of US dollar from now until 2050. If you want to be in line with the Paris Agreement, we need to move 24 of these uh, trillions to the clean energy. So moving from uh, the actual commitment to 24 more trillions for for clean energy, and we have to add at the top 33 trillion US dollar. This means 4.5 trillion US dollar per year. And as we can see, and I will be happy to respond to, to, to questions, uh, this big effort, tremendous effort that we are calling for, will also well, uh, bring, uh, will bring with it a very strong benefit in terms of GDP and in terms of new, of new jobs. My last comment, as we have made clear in the uh, World Energy Outlook preview, that the windows of opportunity to be in line with 1.5 agreement is becoming, is closing. And the path to get there is inevitably narrowing. So we know that we are, our scenario is asking for a tremendous engagement by the, 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 the countries, but I think this is the way to get there where we should be in 2050. So back to you, Jacob. I hope I've been very short enough to allow for questions to come. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, how optimistic are you that this scenario of um, $131 um, trillion um, dollar investment until 2050 uh, can be reached? I mean, we are seeing actually this week, um, a lot of international to uh, talks focusing towards that goal. Are you getting increasingly optimistic at the moment? You know, first of all, we are trying to get what is the nation we are discussing. So we are saying 4.4 trillion of US dollar. Try to, to think that uh, the global GDP in 98 uh, is uh, close to 19 uh, US trillion dollar per year. Uh, the uh, capital formation that we can be uh, considered equal to investment is usually between 80%, 25%. This is the range. So we are talking about something about 20 trillion of investment per year. We are calling for this 25% of this investment, globally speaking, to be dedicated to the energy transition. So we think that uh, is, uh, is feasible, and uh, all the recent, recent commitment from many countries around the world, the new, uh, uh, to say, uh, be back of the US administration, the new uh, uh, deal that is, uh, I think is happening between uh, United States and, and China, the, the commitment from Japan, EU, South Africa and others may start to think that this could be could be done. But I want to be clear, it's a tremendous effort, the direction is there and we have to move fast in that direction. Um, what is the role for um, Germany in such a transition? Um, uh, what do you think um, could be done here, also in terms of um, hydrogen? Um, is it uh, Technology is certainly going forward here, um, but should Germany import most of its uh, its need, or um, should it be um, looking for its own production? You were talking about hydrogen cost coming down, but I think that's not so much the case in um, countries like Germany, but uh, more in very sun-rich, wind-rich nations. So, naturally, uh, the uh, renewables will give to the country 
uh, more uh, capacity to be energy independent. Nevertheless, and uh, especially for the European country where land could be a constraint, uh, we have also to, to think that part of uh, our green hydrogen could be imported. But I have uh, also learned how Germany is moving fast. Germany has been the one to make the pilot green hydrogen becoming uh, working and serving uh, uh, steel uh, uh, factories. Is already going and reaching agreement with uh, the country with, uh, where the sun is uh, and the land is more uh, available together with the wind to import the green hydrogen that is necessary to feed the industrial uh, system. We uh, think that uh, Germany is leading in the path and is showing the way for many other countries. What do you think about so-called um, bridge technologies, um, for example, uh, natural gas for power generation, but also um, options like blue hydrogen, for example? You are speaking for IRENA, the renewable energy um, um, agency. Uh, so are you skeptical about these options? Do you think they should play a small role or do you think they will? Uh, this bridge will be quite broad, so to speak, for a few decades at least? Or should we invest, invest everything in 2050 ready technology, if you like? So our assessment is that uh, the energy system of the future will be largely based on renewables and complemented by green hydrogen and by modern bioenergy. Naturally, we have to consider that the globe has uh, consisted in many regional uh, entities, so uh, with different characteristics. And this could play a role in certain country, for example, the big uh, gas and, uh, producer that they can use uh, the uh, the gas temporary for building blue hydrogen. Uh, generally speaking, naturally we are in favor to go straight to the green uh, to the green hydrogen. Uh, we have seen how the competitiveness of the green hydrogen moved closer to our time from 2050. Uh, something thank uh, so last year with 2030 are the number of, uh, of arena or 2025 the number of many companies. So as far as we build the a, a market for hydrogen and we can in the context of the recovery funds uh, give providing help uh, in terms of supply and demand for the uh, green hydrogen so for the catalyzer, I think that we can uh, really run in the direction of, uh, of green hydrogen. But uh, we still think that uh, the blue hydrogen will continue to have a minor role, but we have, uh, they will have a role until 2050 in certain uh, geographical area with certain uh, economic uh, characteristics. Lastly, let's talk about Europe. Um, the European Commission presented the Green New Deal um, last year, Europe, Europe's plan for uh, a net zero future. Um, but a lot of the regulation has to be spelled out during the next months. What are your expectations? Where would you like to put your focus in, uh, on in the, deba in the debate? So first, uh, be in a, a European. Uh, what I, I like to to point out the, that the European Union has led the process, has led the process, coming with the green, uh, the uh, the new green energy deal. Uh, what is made is that they provide example, and then uh, uh, the EU has been followed by many several countries. And then also the United States is, uh, is joining the, the, the good company in some way. So what uh, uh, is possible to, to imagine uh, that, uh, first of all, the, the Green Deal uh, is uh, a very good example where there is this move to the clean energy 
At the same time, there is uh, thinking about ensuring that the transition could be inclusive, inclusive and just. So the one that are moving from one, system, one sectors to the other in the energy system may be assisted in this, uh, in this, uh, in this passing. And there is also room for cooperation, making clear that uh, from the climate crisis, we can, uh, we can uh, overcome it only if we will work together with all the other countries. In some way, I think the pandemic is teaching us that getting out for something like that, we have to work together. And in certain sense, the, uh, the climate change has also the same characteristic that for fighting it, we have to work together. So naturally, the, the goals concerning the, 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 the renewables has to be uh, updated. But uh, I, I think that this could be easily done. What is also important, if we can say, is that uh, we move straight forward in ensuring the uh, renew of the in infrastructure to ensure flexibility and interconnectivity uh, in the EU using uh, the, the digitalization, the artificial intelligence, and that we also have to work domestically in the framework of the European Union to build a market that is more, I to say, more easy to renewables. Because our the market, the structure of the market, the way the contracts are conceived, still uh, are in some way the result of an old energy system that was decentralized at basic fossil fuel. Now we are going to a very different system that will be a decentralized one with many actors contributing to design the system. So we need to ensure the flexibility and the interconnectivity. So grid and infrastructures are naturally uh, uh, something that has to be a first priority. Thank you very much, Mr. La Camera, for um, giving us the big picture, the Hubschrauber perspective, as we say in German.